We're now going to talk about Carolingian illuminated manuscripts from the late 8th through the 9th century. And we're going to divide this into different sections. The first section we call the court school because it is believed to be associated with the court or the uh, palace at Aachen. We have a fairly large survival of Carolingian manuscripts and they show us the development of Carolingian art and also the development of Western medieval art. Now manuscripts were very important You'll remember that Charlemagne and his successors were very interested in education, in the preservation of knowledge, and in the standardization of the liturgy. So manuscripts were needed, they needed liturgical books to standardize the liturgy and to found monasteries. They needed books to, for learning and the preservation of knowledge and for scholarship of the Carolingian period because uh, they didn't just copy, they also, um, various people wrote their own manuscripts. Uh, Einhardt wrote a life of Charlemagne. Um, Hinkmar of Rams and some, many of the other uh, Carolingian authors, uh, Rabanus Maris, uh, <laughs> uh, Walfried Strabo, uh, they wrote many, many books. And also, uh, they needed manuscripts, they needed books, uh, to repair the low state of education in the Frankish lands. Uh, you'll remember we mentioned Alcuin. Alcuin of York was brought to Aachen, was brought into the Carolingian realm uh, to be essentially the director of education at the palace. And, and he wrote textbooks. Now, late antique and uh, manuscripts copied from late antique manuscripts were brought from Rome. And remember that uh, the Pope and the Carolingian dynasty have very strong ties. Uh, Byzantine manuscripts were brought in. There are three main influences. The Anglo-Saxon, the Late Antique or Roman, and the Byzantine influence. And you're going to see these three main influences in Carolingian manuscripts. Uh, sometimes more one than the other, sometimes combined. But let's go over that. The first one, the Anglo-Saxon influence. Well, remember that Alcuin comes from York and that other English monks come into the Carolingian Empire and they bring with them books and they bring with them the knowledge of their own traditions. You do see the Hiberno-Saxon influence often as interlaced patterns. Now, those same kind of uh, interest in geometry and interlaced patterns would appeal to the native Frankish northern traditions as well. And then the second influence, very important influence, the influence of late antique manuscripts. So these are early Christian manuscripts or copies after early Christian manuscripts which are brought from Rome. Uh, some might even be brought from England because remember that England um, has a great deal of Roman influence after the Council of Whitby ruled that uh, the liturgies should be standardized according to the Roman rule. And of course with um, St. Augustine of Canterbury coming into uh, England, coming into England and bringing with him Roman manuscripts. So there would be a very, very strong influence of late antique manuscripts and we will see how the classical tradition is revived uh, during the Carolingian period. Uh, that's why they call it the Carolingian Renaissance. Also, there was some influence from Byzantium. Uh, now this would be a contemporary influence. Uh, manuscripts and perhaps Byzantine scribes and painters that came into Western Europe We've already seen an example of Byzantine painters coming into Western Europe at Castle Seprio and those murals that show the late antique impressionism and energy with Byzantine figural style and iconography. A manuscript we're going to talk about very shortly, the Coronation Gospels of Charlemagne, has inscribed in its margin a Greek name, Demetrius Presbyter, which some people have suggested means that that perhaps the scribe or even the illuminator uh, might have been uh, a Byzantine trained uh, scribe or artist. Now, 
in some cases, art historians have tried to reconstruct what models were used. Uh, for example, there was a um, Terence, the, the Roman playwriter, Terence. Uh, there is a manuscript of Terence that was illuminated at, uh, at Rems, at Hovere's monastery. And we, we determined that from the style. Uh, and it seemed to have been copied from a late antique uh, manuscript with images of the actors wearing masks. Uh, so that's one of the, the influences. That the original manuscript doesn't survive, but we assume it had to have existed because uh, what seems to be a copy survives. At other times, uh, scholars argue about how much of a manuscript is a copy and how much of it is the creative use of the sources, maybe a creative compilation or an entirely new image, uh, but based on uh, the knowledge of uh, these divergent sources. Likely, there's both going on. And this is a very important point that I want to make. It is at this time, in the Carolingian period, that the dynamic vigor and abstraction, that dynamic linearism of the northern tradition, meets and combines with the late classical, uh, impressionistic, humanistic tradition. Uh, this more illusionistic tradition where you have the appearance of solidity uh, with shading and figures that can turn in space. And you have this sort of abstract and illusionistic tradition, and they combine. And they form something new. They form the basis for Western medieval art. Now, that's exciting in its own right. I think some of these manuscript illuminators are some of the great artists of the Western tradition. Uh, it's also very interesting because we see this influence going on into uh, the later periods, into the Ottonian and into the Romanesque period. Carolingian manuscripts are arranged by schools or groups, and this refers to the area in which the scriptorium uh, is believed to have existed, usually at a monastery. Uh, or maybe a group of monasteries in the same area. Now, that can be a little bit confusing because sometimes different scholars even use different names. So what this is is a kind of system of approximation uh, to organize and communicate. I'm not really going to uh, get very rigorous in testing you on the different schools. Uh, two that you might want to be aware of, because they are very distinctive in their style, would be the Palace Group, or the Palace School, and the Rem School. Uh, but we're going to talk about all of these, and this will be how we have uh, organized our material. There are four or five uh, main schools, and then there are some subdivisions. So the first one we're going to talk about is called the Court School. And it's believed to be associated with a scriptorium in Aachen, uh, associated with the palace or the court of Charlemagne. Uh, this is the earliest of the manuscript schools. And it is subdivided stylistically. There's one group that's called the Atta group. The name Atta is from uh, the uh, sister of Charlemagne. And one of the manuscripts is the uh, Atta. Uh, Gospels, although I don't think we're going to look, I don't think that one's in your text, so we're not going to look at that. Uh, and the other is the palace group, and the image that you're seeing here, uh, the four evangelists in the landscape, is from the palace group. And you'll see that the Attic group has a number of different uh, influences, one of which is Byzantine. Uh, the palace group is probably the most classical of all of the Carolingian manuscript schools. It has uh, the greatest illusionism, as you can see. The second group is the one that I'm most interested in, and that's the Rem School. The Rem School was the most influential, uh, and it is a very exciting style. Uh, we believe that it stems from the scriptorium at the monastery at Hovers in the Rems diocese. And it's marked by energetic line and gesture. And there are two archbishops who are very notable. One is the Archbishop Ebo, 
who uh, was uh, the archbishop from 816 to 835. And then he was deposed. There's a lot of politics going on here. Uh, and he was uh, reinstated, 840 to 44. Uh, and then, of course, there was another <laughs> archbishop, uh, Hinkmar, uh, who was the archbishop from 845 to 882. It's not quite that neat because at a certain amount of time, uh, these were appointed by different emperors, uh, so at a certain amount of time, there was an overlap uh, of uh, two people claiming to be the Archbishop of Rams. Um, but they were very influential and had a lot of uh, political connections as well. Then, from Tours, uh, and these seem to be from the Monastery of St. Martin of Tours, uh, this is the most prolific manuscript school. There are about 300 manuscripts that survive, even though the library was destroyed by Norsemen in the late 9th century. So even though the library was stored, restored, so many of these manuscripts had been sent out over the empire to other um, places, to other monasteries and other places, that uh, we have a very large survival. Uh, the surviving manuscripts had been sent as exemplar you know, to another manuscript, uh, to another manuscript scriptorium who would be copying it. Or they had been gifts uh, given to, to various dignitaries. Not all of these, in fact, most of these manuscripts ha do not have uh, illumination, or at least uh, they might have illuminated letters, but they don't have the full page uh, illuminations. We're going to look at some that do, however, of course. One of the reasons that Tours was so prolific uh, was because Alcuin became the abbot at St. Martin of Tours after he retired from the court as uh, what we call the, what, the director of education? Would that be his title? I don't know what his title was. Um, now, during his abbacy, we do not have any full page illuminations. We have uh, beautiful script, initials, and we have scholarship because all Hewan did a revision of the Bible, a version of the Bible. Um, that was considered to be sort of the standard Bible. And this was in great demand. And so this is why there were so many copies made. The abbots there were often Anglo-Saxons, and some of the monks were Anglo-Saxons, so we do have that influence. But we also have the influence of uh, other Carolingian schools, as we'll see. And then, you see I have here Met School and the Court School of Charles the Bald. Well, where was the Court School of Charles the Bald? Uh, some people think that it was at Saint-Denis. Some people think it was at Metz. So should we separate these out, or should they be one school? Big question mark there. Um, we're going to look at the Drogo Sacramentary. The, we're going to look at the Drogo Sacramentary from Metz about the middle of the ninth century. And then later in the century, when Charles the Bald is the emperor, we're going to look at a work called the Metz Sacramentary, and it's also called the Sacramentary of Charles the Bald. Um, the so-called court school of Charles the Bald is a very eclectic school. In other words, there's a lot of different stylistic influences on here, uh, especially influenced by Rams and by Tours. And as I say, the, the location is uncertain. It's sometimes called the School of Saint-Denis uh, because Charles was the lay abbot of the monastery at Saint-Denis and is associated very closely with Saint-Denis. Um, another theory places it at Rems. And as you see, uh, it's also associated with Metz. So not sure where that was. Let's start with the court school. And we're going to look at the very first example of a Carolingian manuscript uh, illumination. And this is in the Godeskal Gospels, which dates from 781 to 783. Uh, this is a good example of the court school style, where there's a lot of Byzantine influence uh, in it, uh, simplified forms, uh, but figural forms, of course. It is a lectionary. Uh, in other words, it's not the entire Gospels. It is the parts of the Gospels that the priest would be reading. 
and so it is a service book. The name Godeskalk Gospels comes from Charlemagne's scribe Godeskalk, and this was written by Godeskalk. Uh, it, he's not necessarily the illuminator. We don't always know if the scribe the person who wrote the letters is the same person as the person who painted the pictures. There may be a division of labor. Um, but, uh, but there is a colophon that tells us that this, that this was written by Godeskalk to commemorate the 14th year of Charlemagne's reign and the baptism of his son Pepin. This is a luxury manuscript. It was made for uh, the emperor. And so we have purple parchment with gold and silver letters. And it is reminiscent of imperial Byzantine manuscripts. Uh, we're going to look at some of the stylistic influences here. In this manuscript, you can see we're looking at the uh, large full page illumination of Christ enthroned and Christ's blessing and he's holding the Gospels. You can see here that the artist is trying to reconcile two opposing styles. The style of northern abstraction and here you'll see particularly some insular influences. We're going to look at some details uh, to show you the interlace patterns that appear here uh, and that interest in, in geometry. Uh, and also the Byzantine influence. The figure of Christ seems to be from a, seems to be either copied from a Byzantine manuscript or derived, in other words, uh, creatively reconstructed uh, from manuscripts that have some Byzantine influence. So we see the frontal Christ on his throne and you see the throne with the big poofy Byzantine uh, uh, cushion that we often have seen before with the virgin and child or Christ uh, seated on a, a throne. Uh, he has a footstool, in this case the footstool actually does seem to recede into depth uh, 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 rather than uh, the lines going outward. And so you have this very frontal figure with these very, very large eyes. There are some small reference to illusionism. If you look behind Christ, there is a kind of uh, wall that is created and then a sort of uh, almost zigzag pattern with these panels. Uh, is it really supposed to be uh, coming out of space? Is it, is it just pattern? You can see the pattern of the trees along the horizon. Uh, you can see the large IHS and then the Chi Rho, and here it is a sigma, uh, but abbreviating Jesus Christ. Uh, and you can also see the interlace pattern in the uh, margin, in the uh, border around there above Christ's head. So there is certainly this love of pattern. And instead of having any kind of shading for the drapery folds, we simply have lines. Uh, presumably one of uh, Christ's knees is supposed to be projecting forward by foreshortening, but it does seem to be somewhat flattened. There doesn't seem to be a, a great deal of solidity to this figure. And here we're looking at the feet. Feet, re feet remind you very much of Byzantine art, and then you look down and you see that the base of the footstool is the uh, interlace pattern uh, with the uh, insular or uh, uh, Hiberno-Saxon influence. We mentioned that this manuscript was created for the baptism of uh, Charlemagne's son Pepin. And so, um, but that, that not only gives us a, a date, uh, but it also explains the, the image of a baptismal font. And here you're seeing the, the double page opening uh, where you have a baptismal font on one side and then the incipit page uh, with a large, uh, clear letters uh, on the other side. The baptismal font is considered to be a fountain of life. And as we said, it's dedicated uh, to Charlemagne and to his second wife, Hildegard. Uh, and refers to the baptism of their son, Pepin. Uh, Pepin was baptized in Rome uh, by Pope Hadrian at the Lateran Baptistery in the year 781. 
And what we're seeing then is a stylized uh, rendition of the Lantern, the Lateran Baptistry. And here we see the Lateran Baptistry uh, as it is today. It is an octagonal uh, font. And you can see uh, the font below uh, with a canopy above. And the canopy is held up by, uh, by variegated marbles uh, and uh, classical columns. And all of these things we see with, uh, a more with an elaborate canopy surmounted by a cross, which presumably would have been uh, what it would have been in the Carolingian period. Uh, you also see that there are all of these animals surrounding it. And we've seen some of these uh, paradisial uh, birds. Uh, and uh, and uh, here's a stag. And we've talked about the symbolism of these before in the early Christian period. Um, the peacock, for example, could refer just simply to be a paradisial bird, or uh, the eyes in the peacock uh, tail, or the eye of God, the all-seeing eye of God, or the idea of the peacock representing eternity, because it was believed that peacock flesh never rotted. Uh, the stag, remember, uh, the stag is a symbol for the soul, the heart who uh, is like the soul panting for the living waters. Uh, Christ, of course, talks about uh, the fountain of life. Um, uh, when the Samaritan woman uh, gives him water, and uh, he says uh, that he can give her water from which she will never thirst. Uh, and of course, he's speaking of, of, of spiritual matters. Uh, she takes him at first to mean uh, that it is uh, you know, some kind of magic water. Uh, a baptismal font, in a very real sense, would have been seen as a kind of fountain of life. Because when you were baptized into the Christian church, it was believed that this wiped out your sins, including original sin, which is why they would baptize infants. And this made it possible for you to go to heaven, for your soul to have eternal life. Uh, if you were not baptized, uh, your soul could not go to heaven. Now, we see this image of the Fountain of Life, and it appears three times in court school manuscripts. Uh, here is one. We're going to look at another one. And as you can see, the forms are abstracted, simplified. The animals uh, don't seem to go back into space. They seem to uh, sort of rise up on the page. It has been suggested that the fountain was probably from an early Christian prototype. Uh, and certainly uh, the animal forms might have been as well, but we're already familiar with the animal iconography from such things as the deer and the living waters in the mausoleum of Galapocidia and in Gospels from the 8th century. Something that many of the Carolingian Gospels or lectionaries have are author portraits. In other words, the portrait of the author of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, in front of his Gospel, uh, usually accompanied by his symbol. And of course, we've already seen this uh, idea in Hiberno-Saxon manuscripts, uh, particularly uh, the Lindisfarne Gospels, which seems to have uh, a more illusionistic model. And here what I'm doing is showing you uh, St. Mark from the Go to Skull Gospels with a Roman author portrait. Now, this is a poet. Uh, he is a fresco on the wall of, uh, I think, the House of Meander at Pompeii. And of course, none of the Carolingian uh, scribes, uh, none of their predecessors uh, would have ever seen this because it was covered up by volcanic ash. And of course, Pompeii was only rediscovered in the 18th century. But why is this here? It's there to show that there was a tradition of Roman author portraits, which gets passed on into Christianity and becomes the, uh, the four evangelists. Uh, and they are the authors of the four Gospels. One of the differences between a Roman author portrait and the evangelist author portraits is that the Roman author is not showing writing. That was manual labor. Generally, a Roman poet or philosopher or you know, whoever, a writer, uh, would dictate to his scribe, who was usually a slave, 
and uh, he would do the manual labor of writing down the uh, author's words. But with the Christians, this idea of divine inspiration coming to the, uh, the actual author and him writing down the words by which he has been divinely inspired, it's almost, it's almost a kind of magic. Um, that is a very important thing. Uh, the idea that then the scribes who are copying these, they're doing the labor of copying the Gospels. They're, they're in a kind of tradition that follows through. So writing became a very honored tradition. Uh, only you know, relatively few people could read and write. Uh, so this becomes uh, something that you do see the authors doing uh, here uh, with a uh, stylus uh, or a pen uh, writing in the Gospel. So let's look at these. Here we have uh, St. Mark with the lion. And the lion seems to be walking across uh, the band with the uh, evangelist name. And uh, he's, the uh, saint has turned up uh, looking at his symbol, almost as though symbol is imparting the words and the inspiration. Uh, as you can see, they're very stylized. They are figural forms. They turn in space. And yet, uh, all of the shading and uh, the setting have become flat. You have the shading has become lines. So you could see this coming out of an illusionistic uh, tradition, but very stylized. The same thing with St. John. He leans across, or his arm stretches across uh, to uh, dip the, the uh, pen in the ink. And he's going to be writing on his gospel. Uh, and his, uh, his symbol, in this case, the eagle. Uh, is on this little uh, crenellated wall behind him uh, and uh, evidently serves as the source of inspiration. Another work from the uh, Atta school or the court school um, is the Bible of St. Medard of Sosons, either the St. Medard Bible or the Sosons Bible, sometimes abbreviate to that, uh, from the early 9th century. And here you are seeing an incipit page, a beginning page to the Gospel of St. Mark. And uh, once again, you can see a variety of traditions. Uh, you see the figural tradition with these little uh, faces. Reminds you of Byzantine uh, roundels with the frontal images looking out. Uh, it's a very cl clear classical letter forms. And then you see the arches uh, that have become patterns and uh, decorated. Uh, reminds you perhaps of canon tables from things like the Lindisfarne or the um, um, Gospel of uh, Kells, um, and they seem to be adorned with uh, painted gems. The very border looks like it is uh, uh, gemstones, but it's actually painted there. And in fact, if you look at the very bottom, uh, you'll see a uh, illustration of a cameo. And some, as we're going to hear, some uh, classical cameos did survive. And the Carolingians became, uh, at least some of them, became very skilled at uh, creating and carving intricate, uh, intricate images into uh, crystals and into gemstones. We have here both St. Mark and St. John again. Uh, once again, we have this border that looks like metalwork uh, and the uh, and the authors of the Gospels are beneath uh, patterned um, archways. There seems to be a cameo uh, in the center of the arch above St. Uh, Saint, Saint Mark. And St. Mark's, uh, uh, Mark's lion here is extremely active. Uh, he uh, looks like he's pointing out in his book uh, what uh, the author below should be writing. And of course, once again, you have this close connection with the author looking up at the symbol. Uh, there's a, a good deal of setting in the sense of these draperies drawn back. Uh, and of course, uh, things we've already seen with the uh, kind of throne or set uh, or a seat on which the uh, author uh, is, is seated uh, with a, a pedestal. Uh, on which his book rests. And here the drapery forts get to be very, very intricate. Uh, they group the patterns. Uh, and so you have, once again, that combination of stylized forms uh, abstracted from more illusionistic images. Here's St. John. Now, St. John is uh, seated with his book open on his lap. 
and his throne has become an entire architectural structure. <laughs> uh, it seems to have uh, various stories and uh, openings. And his symbol, uh, the eagle above, has a banderole, a scroll uh, with the words. And then once again, this uh, stylized archway uh, with the uh, gemstones, including cameos, uh, jewels, pearls. Within the Bible of St. Medard of Soissons, we see another one of these fountains of life. Presumably, it has a common model with the Godeskalk Gospels, but this one seems to be a bit more sophisticated. Uh, it seems to be a bit more illusionistic. Uh, I would say that the artist here has greater skill in creating illusionism. And so one of the questions is, is this because it's a more accurate copy or is it just that the artist uh, coming a little later has seen more illusionistic manuscripts and, and can do this? So many of the forms are the same. We see the octagonal font, only here we're looking down into the water and it's actually uh, hexagonal, which would be octagonal, but they uh, reduced this number of sides. Uh, we ha see the very elaborate canopy overhead surmounted by the cross, but it's now within its own architectural space as you have the walls uh, that seem to be concave, that seems to move back, uh, kind of a U. And the animals also, um, some of them uh, appear to be seated on um, molding or an architrave or the top of a building, a cornice. Uh, others seem to stand on the ground. They have an actual place. And they have some shading. If you look at the deer particularly, and you have both a heart and a hind, uh, a stag and a doe, uh, and they are modeled in light and dark with uh, different, different bands of color. And here's just a few more examples. These are cannon tables. Uh, remember how we saw uh, in the insular manuscripts uh, the canon tables that combined all four of the uh, gospel symbols. And you see that. And you also see these curly found, these curly, uh, these, uh, these curly columns. Uh, the columns at St. Peter's uh, around the altar were uh, these twisting columns. And they had an association with uh, Solomon, actually. So, that is probably the source of them, uh, the idea of the curling columns, the twisting columns. Uh, only here they look more like ribbons than something that could actually uh, uh, support uh, an actual uh, uh, tympana or, or uh, structure above. Um, and then you have one that uh, doesn't seem to have too much text. It must be the, end, the beginning of a, of a canon table. Uh, we have the lamb on his throne, a kind of apocalyptic scene. Then the four uh, evangelist symbols below. And then a, a really a kind of city, perhaps the heavenly Jerusalem, uh, shown uh, between or behind the columns. This is the Aachen Gospels. And this is from the group that we call the Palace Group. Um, the images from the palace group are those which have the greatest amount of classical illusionism. You see figures that really do seem to turn in space. They have not been flattened. Uh, the draperies are shaded in light and dark, and they seem to wrap solid bodies. Uh, in some cases, you also have landscape backgrounds. And in this case, you can see uh, that the figures fit into the landscape. There are four of these manuscripts that are believed to be from what we call the Palace School, these very classicizing images. Uh, the manuscripts are found in Vienna, in Aachen, and those are the two we'll look at, uh, and others in Brussels and Brescia. And probably they come from the same model or models. They all have evangelist portraits. They do not have narrative stories of the life of Christ. Um, and the probable dates for are from about 795 to 810, so circa 800. It's a great date for, for the palace school. Uh, we do know who headed the court scriptorium at this time, and he's a very famous man, uh, Einhardt, who was Charlemagne's biographer. 
He was also supposed to be a sculptor, although nothing that he has survived, nothing that he has created has survived, although there are some descriptions. Um, and he also uh, founded, uh, I know of at least one city that he founded, maybe more. Uh, he founded the little the town of Zelligenstadt, the blessed city, which is uh, about 25 kilometers from Frankfurt. Um, did Einhard actually paint these? Probably not. He's probably at the head of the scriptorium uh, and might decide who does the painting. Uh, you know, the most skilled artist. I always learn this as the Aachen Gospel. Sometimes you do have variant names for these uh, because it is in the, tr the treasury at Aachen. Uh, so it's still in its original location and sometimes it will be on display. Uh, I actually got to see it <laughs> decades and decades ago. Um, as you can see, you have in one page all four of the four evangelists, and each one is identified by uh, a sort of uh, half-length or uh, crouching uh, figure of its uh, symbol above the writer, uh, the winged man or the angel for St. Matthew, the winged lion for St. Mark, the uh, winged ox for St. Luke, and the eagle up there in the upper right uh, for uh, St. John. And we've already talked about the symbolism of those, that they come from the four living creatures who surround the throne of God and sing Sanctus, 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 Holy, 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 in Ezekiel and Revelation. And here we have a detail of uh, St. Luke, and you can see he's wrapped up in, almost like a, wrapped up in a toga. <laughs> you know, he's wrapped up, he looks very, very uh, classical. Uh, his figure is shaded, uh, and he seems to uh, fit into the landscape. Uh, you might notice that the scroll that the, uh, the ox has uh, seems to come out into space, uh, that there's a, a suggestion of foreshortening here uh, with, the, uh, with the evangelist symbol. Probably the most famous of these uh, manuscripts from the palace school, and one of the most famous of the Carolingian manuscripts, is the manuscript that has several names, the Coronation Gospels, or the Coronation Gospels of Charlemagne. Um, this was said to have been found in the tomb of Charlemagne when it was opened in the year 1000 by the Emperor Otto III. Now, Charlemagne died in 814, which means that this would have had to have been created before uh, he died, if it's going to be placed in his uh, tomb. And usually the date around 800 is used. The reason it's called the Coronation Gospels is because after Otto III discovered it, it was used in the coronation of the Holy Roman Emperors. So sometimes it's called the Coronation Gospels of Charlemagne, not necessarily referring to his coronation, but to the, the coronation of his uh, successors, in a sense, uh, the Holy Roman Emperors, uh, and also that he owned this gospel. It was placed in his tomb. It's also known as the Schatzkammer Gospels. Uh, Schatzkammer means the treasury, because it was former, formerly in the Vienna Schatzkammer, the Vienna treasury. Uh, now it is the, in the Kunstsorische Museum in Wien, or Vienna. We're looking at the image of St. Matthew, um, the author portrait of the evangelist writing the manuscript, uh, writing the Gospels. He doesn't have a symbol to tell him what to do. <laughs> He's just very focused on this page, however. And the classical illusionism is simply remarkable. Now, I should point out that there are places where the uh, paint has flaked off, and so sometimes you have what looks like uh, kind of splotches. It's a purple manuscript, and that, by that we mean that the parchment is dyed purple, which means that it is an imperial manuscript. Purple was associated with emperors. It also has gold and silver letters, uh, suitable for an emperor. And so when the paint is flaking off, you can see some of the purple parchment below. Now, when we look at this, we see really amazing illusionism. You have a figure with the drapery that seems to wrap the body. We see the thigh, we see the calf, the shin, uh, we see the shape of the arm. 
Uh, we see one leg behind another, and we see the shading. It's not simply line, 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 line. Um, there is a, a variety of light and dark shading uh, that gives you the illusion that this figure is solid uh, as he sits uh, on his bald stool uh, and writes the gospel. One thing that does seem to flatten it out a little bit is the great, huge, gold disc halo. Uh, take that away, and if you didn't know it was in a gospel, you might say, oh, maybe this is a late antique author portrait. Maybe that was its model. Uh, probably a model of the gospels, though. In this manuscript, the Coronation Gospels of Charlemagne, in the book of St. Luke, there was a Greek name, Demetrius Presbyter, written in gold. So, you know, who was this? Was he the scribe? Uh, was he the artist? Does this mean that it is copied from a Byzantine manuscript? Does it mean that we have the presence of Greek uh, artists? Does it mean that we have the presence of Greek artists and scribes at Charlemagne's court? I hate to say it, we don't, and I don't have answers for you. <laughs> and I don't have answers for you. Lots of questions. And then if we look very closely at the detail, and think about how much this is blowing up. Uh, so it, it really does give you a sense of the actual brush strokes. It's a very good reproduction. Uh, we see the japery wrapping the body. We see the shading on the face, and we see that this uh, evangelist has a strong, square, Roman jaw and aquiline nose. Uh, you can also see the emphasis on the fingers, that they hold the pen and they, they uh, focus attention on the text. And here we're looking at a detail of the drapery, and you can see we're talking about really we do have different uh, highlights and shades and uh, half tones uh, rather than just simply lines. Uh, and they do seem to suggest uh, a solid uh, volumetric figure beneath the drapery. And here we go out a little. We see his feet. Uh, we see the, uh, the classical fold stool and matching pedestal. And once again, I bring in the, uh, the Roman author portrait, poet, uh, they think it's a, probably a poet. Um, and you can compare uh, the, the similarities and differences, uh, the draperies that seem to wrap the body, that are shaded, uh, figures that seem to turn in space. Uh, but in the case of the Coronation Gospel, the focus is on writing, uh, which is now seen almost as a sacred duty, a sacred labor. Uh, although there's been a lot of paint flaking, there is the suggestion of a landscape behind the, uh, behind the uh, evangelist. And here you see uh, St. Mark. Uh, in this case, we can see a little bit more of the landscape. Uh, Mark has hills uh, surmounted by uh, very uh, sketchy trees. And he is writing on a very long scroll uh, he's a frontal figure, but there does seem to be the, the feeling that he is shaded, his face, his draperies, uh, that they you know, come forth <laughs> rather than are flat against the page. And here we see St. John the Evangelist. Uh, he now has a little architectural structure that he, is, uh, he, he sits before. We really do have a sense that those, uh, those knees may actually come forth, that come out uh, in our direction. Um, in fact, his foot is actually resting on the border, on the frame, as though he's going to project out of the scene. And then we see uh, behind the architectural structure, we see uh, these very, very sketchy uh, plant forms, uh, trees and high grasses. This is quite interesting. Um, I'm not sure about what the color is here. This is the color from the book. It looks dark blue. My guess is that it's probably a purple uh, manuscript. Uh, purple parchment, um, but purple is very hard to photograph, and I've seen purple come out brown, uh, I've seen it come out sort of a bright uh, tone, I've seen it come out anywhere in between. 
Um, so this may simply be the, the phot photograph. Um, it is the incipit, the beginning of the Gospel of St. Mark. And you can see these very clear classicizing letters that were used in the Carolingian period. Uh, but you can also see in the, um, in the first letter uh, some of the patterning that might remind us a little bit of uh, perhaps some insular or northern influence. Just a little bit.